Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Sackoff Show. I am your host, Katie Sackoff. Thank you so much for joining me on this wonderful Tuesday. I am so excited for today's guest. But before we get into that, I want to remind you to stick around after for the hindsight where my producer Jeff and I talk about the episode, but we also answer questions, questions from the actual episodes, but also um, from the Sackoff Show at Gmail. Dot com. So we actually do this fun thing called, we get into the sack. It's a long story. It's fine. But we, we, we answer questions. We talk. We have a good time. It's really fun. Um, so please stick around for that. But I'm going to get into this guest. I'm, I'm really excited for this. If there's any music fans out there, you're absolutely going to freak out about this. My guest today is my friend, one of my favorite composers, uh, Bear McCreary. If you don't know Bear, he is literally the mind behind the scores of Battlestar Galactica, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Black Sails, Outlander, Walking Dead, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, countless video games, and his new album and graphic novel, The Singularity. There are very few people in the world that I meet that I am not only just in, in complete respect over, but like that I'm just in awe of. Bear is one of the most talented human beings I have ever met in my entire life. We met on Battlestar Galactica. We get all into that because the story of how Battlestar Galactica came to be and he came to be the composer of Battlestar Galactica at 24 years old, it's quite remarkable. And I cannot wait for you to hear that story because it's pretty awesome. I am going to get out of your way because this is just a really fun episode. So if you're listening, um, hello, enjoy. If you're watching, what's up? Enjoy. You're going to see and hear one of the, I I think, one of the greatest rock stars um, around. So enjoy my episode with Bear McCreary. <laughs> Is, and what is what I'm looking at, like where you do, where the magic is created? This this is where it is. I'm, I mean, I'm here 18 hours a day sometimes. I mean, 12 hours a day, pretty, pretty standard. When you were a kid, were, were you always musically inclined or was it something that your parents sort of did the thing like all parents are like, here's an instrument, try piano, do something. And then, and then you sort of became good at it or were you always just musically inclined both yeah column a and column b i -hmm. I definitely was musically inclined i loved film music when i was five so when i was five i started listening to movies and go what is that i want to do that what is that and Uh and then uh, at at age six i started piano lessons and i started piano lessons because my mom put me in gymnastics and in baseball and i i think by the time i was nine I remember at one point bargaining with her. I I said, "Mom, I I'm, I hate gymnastics. I'm terrible at softball, but like I, I I love the piano. Like I will keep doing this. Can I not do this other stuff, please?" Uh, it reminds so me yeah, of that, definitely that line from uh, from uh, Clueless, where she said, "My doctor told me to uh, avoid." anything where balls fly at my face. Um, <laughs> yes. And then she goes, well, there goes your social life. Um, yep. That yep. was, that was me as a kid too. Like I was like, I don't want balls flying at my face. Uh, yeah. And there's just a thing. It's funny you would word it that way because I, in softball, I always was like outfield. I mean, mm. is there an outer field like the Kuiper Belt outfield? Like, you're like, God forbid it comes my direction. Yes, I know. And so I was just just praying, like, don't hit it out here. You know, <laughs> um, I, I hated it. And yeah, local businesses sponsored the little the little league softball course, teams, right? Yeah. So we would we would go up against like Little Caesars Pizza and Fred Meyer Pharmacy. Okay, but for whatever reason, two years in a row. 
So I was on a team with these dark brown shirts that said Jones Funeral Home. <laughs> okay. So I'm on the funeral home team losing and, and being miserable. Like, like the, this is not a great uh, way for me to fall in love with softball. And maybe that's no. partly, partly pushed me into being a musician. Oh my God. That is hysterical. Like you, you are either the team that is delivering death or getting killed on every game. Like you just uh, think yeah. there's no we were way the to avoid the jokes that children are going to make about that. Yeah, I can also just imagine being in the, the room at Joan's funeral home when they go, you know, we need some business. What can we do to drum up some business? Where 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 are clientele for, you know, dead people? I know. <laughs> Let's sponsor a little league team. That'll, you know, uh, that'll drum up some business. <laughs> this exactly, will work a lot better yeah. than that park bench. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This this is where to go. Uh, so anyway, there you go. And you know what? You know what? 40 years later, I'm still here talking about Jones Funeral Home on your podcast. You so I wonder if they're still work. there. I mean, people, people are still dying. Hey, look, <laughs> if you're dying in the Pacific Northwest, go check it out. You guys, they got a killer softball team. It is a good business. Um, you grew up uh, in Bellingham, like right up the street from me. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you grow up again? St. Helens. So oh St. Helens, Oregon, yeah. literally what? two and a half. I mean, Bellingham's like at the top of Washington. So like you're, if you keep going in, it's very top. Exactly. Blaine is the only town north of us. Uh, and Bellingham is, is sort of the last city. Mm. Uh, you know, I think the population it was when I was there, like 60,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also if you then keep going up the five, you cross the border, you drive for another 90 minutes, you get to Vancouver, uh -huh. where Battlestar was shot. Yes. Um, so I think for you and me, Battlestar Galactica felt very much like a home turf kind of experience. It you know? It did so much so that people think I'm Canadian. Like, they just... They think I'm Canadian. And especially because like when you grow up in the Pacific Northwest, people from Oregon and Washington in our industry, I think a lot of times people do sometimes think, oh yeah, like you're Canadian, like you're Vancouver, right? Like you're, <laughs> you're up yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. But also the, the film boom didn't take off when we were kids. No, uh, no. I it's... mean, I guess it sort of did, but it real Battlestar was sort of at the toward the beginning of it that was. boom where Vancouver became Hollywood North. So I was working up in Vancouver on a little show called The Fearing Mind that was on Fox Family that then became ABC Family. But I was on a show called The Fearing Mind with uh, David Weddle and Bradley Thompson before they wrote for Battlestar Galactica. So when they showed up on Battlestar Galactica, I was like, I know these guys. And they wrote my favorite episodes. That's amazing that you got to work with them before Battlestar. Mm. Uh, obviously, they're, you know, they wrote so many classic episodes. Correct me if I'm wrong. The first one they wrote on their own was 104, Act of yes. Contrition, which was all about y you. And yes. that was that was one of the um early episodes that I was involved in, and I met them all about Starbuck and that's where this the to me we started really like digging into the characterizations more and I just thought with those two writers I, I thought who are these guys these guys are really good yeah and I'm like literally sitting here you're gonna laugh at this trying to figure out what happens in active contrition is that when you can't go home again is when she's stuck on the planet there's it's a two-parter right I so think it is you end up on the planet yes yeah, yes I, and if I remember correctly it's all the like the Cylon goo and the having to get in the ship and fly the ship. And it's all about Starbuck. And I vaguely remember having conversations with them. And they mentioned the episode of The Fearing Mind when my character like gets covered in mud and falls in mud. And it's like really gritty. And I remember them writing these episodes and like being like, oh, you can you can do this, Katie. We've seen you do this before. And I was like, <laughs> sure, just throw Cylon goop in my mouth. That's great. Let's just make me the person. And you, the episode of Fearing Mind, it was mud and cow dung. And in this one, it's Cylon goo and, you know, fake planet dust. Well, they certainly uh, knew that you could handle it. And uh, yeah, and 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 you did. It was an awesome it was an awesome episode. It was amazing.
Yeah, they 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 are. Uh, I mean, all all the writers on the on the show yeah, were so uh, exceptional. Uh, but that's really cool that you you had worked with them. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was such a they're such fond memories the first time, and so you you have this sort of like weird, like you said, all the writers were just phenomenal. I mean, come on, we were so spoiled. But the when you have a relationship going in with two writers, it just like you know they they became my favorite people, and 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 I. I love them dearly. Um, I want to go back, though, to what we were talking about in Bellingham and you and music and everything and and how you were musically inclined, because my mom put me into piano lessons and like, Mary, you've seen me play piano. I it's have. like it's like a step above chopsticks. <laughs> like it's it's really bad. <laughs> so like, yeah. So um, walk me through how you actually it stuck other than I, you didn't want balls at your face. I, I, I did not want balls flying at my face. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, I, I, I was talented. I didn't have to practice a lot to sort of get really good at the pieces that my teacher would show me. And I would basically cram for each lesson right beforehand uh-huh. and look like I had been practicing. And, 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 and eventually, eventually my, my, my teacher figured out pretty fast that I'm not playing throughout the week, the pieces he's assigning. What am I doing? Well, he finds out I'm transcribing film music. I'm trying to figure out how to play Star Wars or Beetlejuice or Star Trek on the piano. I'm, I'm doing my own arrangements. And, and then he really sort of helped me and was sort of like, all right, keep working on the the Gershwin or the Beethoven or the Mozart, I will also help you transcribe these pieces, right? And help you uh, follow what you're excited about with piano. So he really was incredibly helpful. And as a result, there were a lot of things I learned and I, and I picked up a lot of skills in terms of like hearing something and feeling around a piano and starting to make something new, I, I became deficient in some areas. I, I really didn't learn to sight read well enough mm. because we just didn't practice it. Didn't and, and it would not be ultimately until I was in college that I was conducting orchestras and the and the second clarinet would raise their hand and go, is that a B flat or a B natural at bar three? And I would look down and it'd be like, Oh, uh, and I'd have to, then I realized like, oh my God, I'm going to be embarrassed if I don't know how to do this. So I learned, um, you know, because uh, necessity made yeah. possible, you know. Had you, you got so wonderfully lucky at a young age to find a, such a supportive, um, malleable teacher who understood that, you know, you, you teach what someone enjoys whilst also teaching them what they need. Absolutely. And it was a, balancing at because I look back and I go look there were things I needed I just mentioned um sight reading they like uh, you know really learning the scales and the proper technique like we didn't learn those things he chose to not double down on those things so that I could jump to these things I was really excited about because that's what I was practicing anyway yeah. I think also my mom deserves a huge credit here that she um she was a single mom and uh my my dad they they split. He was helpful and, you know, visited, but he was not in my life every day. My mom was and remains an author and an English teacher. So she's getting up in the morning writing novels. So from the age of five, when I'm thinking about film music and I'm enjoying playing piano, I watch my parent wake up in the morning, put on a robe, put on slippers, go to the typewriter and write stories all day. And I think that's what a job is. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So it never occurred to me that being creative and making stories, sitting at a desk all day, you know, whether it's notes or words, it never occurred to me that that's not a job. So I also got to really emphasize that I think a lot of people end up, even when their parents encourage it it's bartered with well get a degree in business or something it it's it's always like covering you know hedging your bets and, and yeah. that happened with me god that's so interesting the, but you know it's also again in hindsight now that i have my own kid very risky right i mean that's but, yes. but you know my mom would be a hypocrite i mean she was writing novels right so yeah. it's like she'd be a hypocrite if she says you know get a day job and don't follow your creative voice you know what's funny is that it, similarly when i was in high school 
Um, you guys probably had this up in Washington too, because we're so close to Canada, but we would have junior, we had a junior hockey team in Portland and we would have junior hockey players come down, live with billet families and play in the WHL. And, um, they would go to high school and they would live with people, but they would go because the WHL was like a, a funnel into the NHL. And so I went to school with like six WHL guys and ended up dating one of them for wow. three, four years, three years, four years. I don't remember. Um, still friendly with him today, but um, I saw him when I was 17, he was 18. I saw him get drafted to the Penguins. So I saw from a very young age, somebody doing something impossible, um, working their butt off but very successful at something that very few are successful at. And I think that for me, very similar to you seeing your mom, that to me, that model of dating someone who was doing something like that, who didn't go to college and didn't do, you know, this, I moving to California and becoming an actor, it seemed possible. I was like, people do crazy shit every day. Look at this. Look who I'm dating. He did this. I could do this. Why not? And so it never yeah. occurred to me that hard improbable things were possible. Yeah, I mean I think that's awesome. And I and and also do not discount there's a nature part of this, some of its nurture, but like you are wired a certain way. You you came out of the womb a certain way and and I believe the same about me as well that like some people are just sort of like I'm going to do that and and when the situation is right, it takes all those factors coming together but um i'm i'm in hindsight you know very grateful for that yeah. i didn't even understand for many many years into my adulthood that not everyone thinks the way that i do yeah and i still struggle with this when did that become clear to you it's still becoming clear to me. I mean, just just the other day, somebody who works at, at my studio, I was, you know, I was talking about you know the way we would tackle a deadline and you know what I would do, and it's and, and then somebody had to be like, yeah, but these other people are not you, and I was like, right, right, that's why I'm me, and and I'm working with other people who are incredibly talented and driven, but I but it is it is a, a recipe for disaster to go well. I would do it exactly this way. Everyone in my world should do it the same way, mm. you know? Yeah. But it was just interesting that like, I, you know, there are people in my life who know me well enough to still just remind me of that, you know, like that's the way you work and that's awesome. But like, that's not the way everybody works. Well, you surround yourself with, with, people that fill the gaps and do things differently. Like you wouldn't, a business would never hire a hundred people that do things the exact same. It's just sort of, you need totally. people who can actually do different things. It's sort of like, you know, um, you know, I don't know, like my ADHD makes me a really great packer and memorizer and I can focus on shit like super clearly and I can do yeah. a million things at once, but my husband cannot. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we're very yeah. different. I didn't marry myself, thank God. So no, I know, I know, I know exactly. I know exactly what you mean, and that is also something in my life. I have spent a lot of time surrounding myself with people, both um, in the collaborators that I work with, who will hire me to write music or do something else, and in the team that I build around me to help me do those things. And in the last five years, I've really opened up another door in my life, which is my creative projects that I'm doing on my own. And who do I invite in to that process? And it's, I'm, you know, the older I get, the more I recognize the, the, the value and just like collaborating with, with people is the most important thing, um, in, in my creative life for sure. Yeah. Um, when you, I know that, uh, what was his name? Um, uh, Richard, Richard Gibbs, Richard Gibbs. Yeah. Was he the guy yeah. that he, yes. Yeah. So Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, was hired to do the mini series of Battlestar Galactica. And how did you know Richard? Is he was the main person for the mini series? Explain that to me. I, I yes. was so long ago. Richard was hired on the miniseries. I was his assistant. Oh, okay. I was okay. his assistant at that time. That was my um, first job out of college. I was 23, I think, when I worked began working for, for Richard. Wow. Um, wasn't my my first 
job, nor my first mentor, who was um, Elmer Bernstein, who was a legend in film music. So the reason I bring up Elmer is that they were like, I got these two experiences working for two film composers. For Elmer, I'm working for a guy who wrote The Ten Commandments, The Great Escape, The Magnificent Seven. Wasn't Elmer in... What was that name? The band called Oingo Boy? No, what was the name of the band? Richard Gibbs was in Oingo Boy. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's With it. Danny Elfman, another yes. film composer. But okay. the, the so and, and I look, I worshipped all these guys when I was a kid. I I I was a fan of all these different kind of film composers. And when I worked for Elmer, I learned so much about like the the core art of storytelling and filmmaking and drama. Mm. And I also got to see a guy in at that time, he was in his 70s, early 70s when I met him. And and I and I thought, this is the life that I want, right? Um, I want to be like this. I, I will hope in, in 50 years, 60 years, I want to be like this guy. Um, with Richard Gibbs, he was um, obviously is much younger and uh, a different generation. And he was really working in contemporary television and film in a way that Elmer wasn't. Elmer's in the top echelon. He's he's a legend. So with Richard, I am learning different things. Mm. I'm learning hands-on how to get something done. How do you get a demo sequenced? How do you uh, mix a, mix a video to present to filmmakers? Just like nuts and bolts, right? And he gets hired on the Battlestar Galactica miniseries. And I remember looking at the first cut of that, and I just thought, this is gonna be important i mean i i at that time was and remain a huge fan of science fiction um and you did not need to spend a lot of time looking at battlestar galactica to realize what it was yeah um so i ended up writing a lot of music on the miniseries supporting him writing additional minutes and you know basically when it went to series he had a lot of film commitments and uh he did a couple episodes that i helped him with and then he left and uh truly ron and david were gonna look for somebody real and <laughs> all they were looking for I somebody real to somebody the real show. yeah i'm i'm not kidding they let this 24 year old child score one episode while they looked for the real person that one episode because of a change up in the mix order. That first episode, the, the, the one episode I was supposed to do was 33. So oh, that's awesome. I wrote 33. And I remember vividly at the mix, the final playback. They did all their notes and I was there and and David Icke was quiet for a second and he goes, What are you doing tomorrow? Let's let's take a look at another episode. And I thought, Whoa, two episodes. I mean, all right. <laughs> and then I did I did a couple more and it just kept going like that. If you remember the Princess Bride, the way the Dread Pirate Roberts says, nice job, Wesley. I'll probably kill you in the morning. <laughs> That's Battlestar Galactica season one for me. Nice job. Oh, I'll probably it. kill you in the morning. Um, what are you doing tomorrow? And yet, exactly. What are you doing? All right. What are you doing tomorrow? Let's check. A, let's let's try another episode. But that is that is how it, it's irresponsible to let a 24-year-old score a show that big. It was just the circumstances of it. I remember meeting you and being like, because I was the youngest person in the cast. You, you and, and I were the, were the same babies. age. And I was like, our fucking composer is my age. <laughs> yes. No, I remember, I remember so many times having to hide my generation. Mm. Because I, I, I would... I was the age or younger than the person in the office asking if I want a coffee when I go in to meet with the producers. And I look it too, right? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm I, I was very baby faced. Um, <laughs> yeah, we both. Were. I, we both. <laughs> I remember one time I learned this the hard way. I was in the in the limo going to a rap party. So this is now season four, and I and there's I think Ike is in there, Tamo, a couple of them. we were we were going from Aaron's house to the library wherever that party was yes the big one at the end the big one at the end and everyone starts talking about back to the future katie and i'm like oh my god i can talk about this this is great and i go oh my god i love back to the future look when i was five that movie changed my life 
It was like the car stopped, right? Brakes screech. When you were, what? And then, you know, David Icke's like, I was going into college, you know, and every, everyone else is like, they're like 18, right? Yeah. And I'm six. Uh-huh. And, and I realized I have made a boo-boo here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you, you could, you had this look on their face. They were like, you could almost see them regretting working with me. Like, you're that young? Why are we working? And then, then it was fine. But it, it, I realized like, I gotta be careful. And I want to yeah. ask you something. Mm. You and I have both, we've both paid our dues. Mm. We've both stuck it out. We've both proven ourselves on Battlestar and other things. And I have noticed the more I'm in the business, I am not the youngest person in the room anymore. <laughs> and then I started to notice, you know, filmmakers are now like my age and now it's starting to shift, Katie. It is. Now they're younger. Have you noticed this? I have. I have. Like it's a trip, it's a trip right? I used to love to tell people how young I was because they were like, I'm sorry, what? And it was like it would shock them. Like they were just like not okay with <laughs> how young I was. Um, and it was a subtle shift. It, it happened probably just even like the last couple of years ago. And I think the craziest part about it was that it happened during COVID. And so it's like, I entered into my forties in COVID. So I lost my 40th birthday, my 41st birthday. Like I lost all of that. And then I showed back up at work and I was like, 43, 42. Right. And it was like, people are like, I, I, I no longer got to say I'm 39 on set. Like that window, that was gone. And all of a sudden I felt like I, people were like, oh, you're, you're that old. I, you could be my mom. And I was like, yes, I could be your mom. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and and do, you, do you start getting the like, the feeling where it's like, share your wisdom. We, we, it's like, oh, we respect you so much. Share the wisdom that you've picked up in all your experience. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not I'm only now. Yeah. I'm only now starting to embrace that. I do want to yeah. observe, however. Yeah. You look incredibly young. You look fucking amazing, if I may say so. Thank you. I feel like, you know, I've, I've got the gray coming in and I'm, I'm kind of embracing it. I've gone gray here. I love it. It's like. As the role of a musician, the gray kind of works for me, right? That it's like, sure, man, I'm, 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 I'm look somewhere between like uh, Mozart meets Gandalf. I'll rock that. That works for me. Yeah. Um, no, I you know listen. I, I bl bless you. I think. I think what you. I. My goal in life is to age gracefully and naturally. And by naturally, yeah. I've had a little Botox. I'm not going to lie to you, but my job is to move my face. And therefore I move, you know, I can't do too. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, I have to be very careful with what I do to my face, but you know, I, 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 my goal is to age. That's always been my goal. My goal has been to go gray when my hair starts to go gray. My goal has been to, you know, like someone the other day on, on social media said, you should do something about those wrinkles. And I was like, no, like I earned Thanks, these wrinkles. Social media, by I the know, way. Social media, like, please yeah. come on. But like, you know what I mean? Like I earned this, like, you know, mm -hmm. aging is truly a gift. And I think that our, I think it's lost on people how blessed we are to age. Like you go spend five minutes in a children's hospital and then come out of there and tell me that you're not lucky to be 40 or 50 or 60 or 70, you know, like yeah. it's, it is something like I, yeah, it's, but it's hard. It's hard in the industry that we're in, you know, thank God I've got good genes. It, so I'm like, Oh, <laughs> thank God. But you know, same. I mean, I, I, I feel the same. And I think that I feel and look better than I ever have. I'm definitely in better I agree. Than I've ever been in my entire life. And 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 I'm happy and I'm learning how to be happier every day. And mm -hmm. I don't look back at my 20s and I'm I'm nostalgic because of all the things that we got to do, but I'm not like I literally wish that was my life now. I wouldn't trade it for anything. No, like, I wouldn't go. I don't want to be that person. That no. person was an idiot. Okay. No. You and by the way, you look fucking cool. Like, I mean, I'm looking at you. There are people listening to this interview, but you look fucking cool. Like when I in my mind, like when someone says who what does a rock star look like? I would be like, bear. 
I think that's what they look like. I'll they take, look like bear. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. Yeah. That is that is part of my new my new life these days. Yeah, it's true. I want to talk about singularity, but I also I I I want to I I, I want to talk a bit about music in the sense that like because I'm so in, I'm so curious about how you pick your projects, how they when you finally got to a point because I know you've worked with Ron Moore a lot. When you got to a point where your reputation started to allow you to, I guess, choose more freely or or sort of go after the projects and really like be competitive. I would imagine that at a certain point you were super competitive with with your peers and they were like, so, yeah. you know, like like for myself, I know that there was a moment where I got to start choosing what I wanted to go after instead of having to take everything that came my way. How do you choose? I found uh, that was a difficult transition for me. Mm. Um, I took on everything for a long time and got initially overextended. And then I found, you know, one of the things that I've done, um, <laughs> I mean, let me, the, the headline is, right, I'm very fortunate to be offered a lot of projects that I want to do. Of course. So of course. It, it's it's less about, you know, how do I choose, but it's like, what can I offer um, to to be involved? So what I've started over the last few years, um, I, I over the last 15 years, I've built up a group of people around me that help me, help me writing minutes, that help me with every aspect of music production, that help me with tech, that help me with administration, picture editing, I mean, everything. I've got a little, little cadre of... Um, of say 15 or 20 people around me at all times. Awesome. And a couple of years ago, I realized, you know, the smart thing to do here, the, the, the stratification is now so wide between my involvement at its most and at its, at its least that I wanted to actually acknowledge it. So I started a few years ago shifting a lot of my credits and I started talking with all my closest showrunners. And then I started with people that would come with me for new jobs. And I said, look, what I want to do is say themes by Bear McCreary, music by Sparks and Shadows. That's my huh. song. Yeah, said, yeah, like yeah. Like a band. It's like a band. Yeah. Well, you're becoming like a production company, like your own production company. And you're, yeah. It's very much that. And I, I often, I would sort of cite Stan Winston a lot mm. where I go, you know, he wasn't painting every light bulb on the Terminator model himself. You wouldn't want him to do that. And uh, similarly, you know, my involvement is I want to craft the themes. I want to be your point of contact. You've got my number if anything goes wrong, but I'm leading the charge, crafting the themes, having those creative discussions. But also, it's a huge advantage mm. if my group of people, and I assign them to your show, so it's like this person is my number two, this person's my number three, it's like a little kind of army, right? Yeah. They're writing cues for you while we're in the, the broader creative discussion. And the vast majority, numerically speaking, of my credits are that now. Most of my credits don't say music by Bear McCreary. Yeah. The ones that do, um, that means something very specific. And, and ultimately, this really kicked into gear when I got The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. When I got that and I wrote every cue myself, um, which I did for the majority of Battlestar, the first few seasons, I was so proud of that. And I thought, you know, if I have seven other shows on the air that all say music by Bear McCreary, it dilutes the work that I did. And I'm taking away from the work that my team is doing. There's an yeah. amount of sort of um, suspension of disbelief that's implausible, right? Yeah, like how absolutely. is one person, how is one person doing all of this? Yeah. And so I have found What's great about that is I can be way more upfront about what I'm excited about. So on Lord of the Rings, I'm writing every cue. On Serpent Queen, I'm crafting the themes and my team is supporting. And then the showrunners know this and my number two and number three become part of the creative conversation. Um, we did that on Percy Jackson and the Olympians for Disney Plus, which was a big show. Yeah. Um, and, and, and in hindsight, it's almost like amazing that Disney let us do that. But it was for the benefit of, of everybody. And, and I'm so proud of that score. And I'm so proud of the, um, the themes that I wrote. But, you know, to answer your question, like, 
I might have had to turn that down, right? Because it's like, I just can't, even if I have somebody else writing a lot of this music, I, I can't be on every Zoom with you. I can't yeah. be on every spotting session, like at a certain point. But if if you understand that, and you know who understands that, Katie? Showrunners. Showrunners. Right? Because they get it. They get it because, because that's they do why it. we have writers' rooms. It's why you've got like a head writer and then a team. They you have exactly. to you basically are surrounding yourselves with a group of people that have allowed you to clone yourself. And you make your butt yep. clone yourself and make yourself on, you know, this guy's better with this, this woman's better with this, this person's better with this, this is this. So you're making different versions of yourself to then come together and create one like you know megatron i i i love that you brought that up yeah that you know back in the day and i mean like the leonardo da vinci day mm. there would be a studio that he or you know his mentor verecchio would run and there would be somebody in the studio that's like the hands that person yeah. does hands right and and they would they would actually kind of specialize they did the same thing um and you know the, ultimately what i found it was this tidal wave of positivity mm. that came into my life because here's what here's what happened it was like there's this credit and enthusiasm for the show and now i am sharing it both privately and publicly with the people that are helping me this group sparks and shadows but it's like the old cliche about love right like you share it you don't lose it mm. you you gain it and the other people get it it's it's like and and i found that I think the thing that even prevented me from doing this was twofold. One, insecurity, like you're afraid to do it. But two, it's just not the industry norm. Um, and and I... And I, God forbid as, you go against the industry norm, right? Well, that became my pitch, right? My pitch was also like, this is the way I'm doing things now. And if you want me on your show, this is how we're going to do it. But also, this is the way I think more people will do it. And it's the right way to do it. But it's not necessarily the way it shouldn't be done. I just said this to my dad the other day. He's like, you know, don't don't recreate the wheel, Katie. This is just the way it's done. You know it'll be successful if you do it this way. And I said, yes, but I will be bored. Yes. And I don't want to be bored. My time is worth more. <laughs> you know what I, I know. mean? Like just because it's done one I know exactly way doesn't what you mean. mean that that's fulfilling and that's the way it should be done. It's just the way that it's done, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so I've been, you know, in terms of choosing, that is what changed. Because now there are, and even though somebody comes to me with a project, I can be very upfront, even in the initial meeting, you know, for features, it's often like, look, my schedule at that time is available. So like, yeah, I'm going to do this. My team will, you know, help support just so that if I get hit by a bus, your movie gets done. You, yeah, exactly. you want this. Okay. <laughs> exactly. You need but this. Like on a sh yeah, yeah, exactly. On a show, I'm often upfront that like, look, like there's a huge advantage to having two or three people master the sound of the show. Mm. So that we can make swift changes and it doesn't matter what your dub schedule is. You know, you want, you want, you want to have amazing music delivered on time. So I might, for this one, I might say, let's do, you know, it would say it becomes a little credit question. Ultimately, just like that's how I would credit it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I found that has been, um, has been great because it's not just about choosing projects in the film and video game and television scoring world. I have been freeing up more and more bandwidth for my own creative life yeah. so that I am a happier person. And that has been, that has made a huge difference in, in, in my yeah. life. And in, in a way, one of the other reasons that I thought, look, I want this Sparks and Shadows thing to start to take off and have a life of its own because you know, ideally, I want to start spending a few months every year playing the singularity in yeah. tours and and collaborating with more artists in the rock and pop space. And like, I'm not stepping away from film scoring, but like that, that pie has got to get bigger because I want pieces well, of it to be other things. And you've made it possible for yourself to step away. That's like, I mean, that is a, that is what business, like successful business owners like thrive for is to get a, get a business so successful that they can go on vacation and they don't have to worry about the ship sinking. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so uh, singularity, like, you know, you, 
I think when you were doing publicity for your live show, which you just had in California, like in February, right? Um, it was uh, March. We announced. Was it March? It. Okay. The so, show was the show. Oh, I'm sorry. The show was May. The show was May. Oh my God. The show was May. God, time is flying. Yeah. Um, you were talking about how you've always been into rock. Like, how would you explain yes. it as like hard rock? Would you explain it as like what kind of rock? I mean, rock is so, so vast. I know. I know. I, so I started loving film music. That's it. I didn't listen to rock. I didn't listen to pop. I didn't listen to anything. And then you're, you're like at home listening through. to the sound like a splash when you're like, I mean, yeah, basically. <laughs> no, I'm listening to like Conan the Barbarian and, uh, you know, Star Wars. And, yeah. And, and then I realized a few things that my favorite film composer, Danny Elfman, had a rock band called Oingo Boingo. Yes. My, one of my favorite movies, Highlander, which had this amazing score by Michael Kamen. But like, well, we'll put that aside. What are these songs by, what's this, Queen? Queen? What is this? This sounds like film music to me. I discovered Pink Floyd, The Wall, and then I discovered Pink Floyd. And then I discovered... Um, I think it was through Terminator 2, the Guns N' Roses song. And I was like, whoa, 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 that's awesome. And then I then I went and I found November Rain. And that like sealed the deal. Okay, rock, I've obviously missed something because rock can be as evocative and epic and powerful and loud as what film music is to me. Um, and I realized that what I really love about music is intense drama. Intense drama. Yeah. So those bands, you know, Guns N' Roses and and Pink Floyd and Queen um, were my gateway. And and then later I I did discover metal and it's like, oh my God, it's even louder and even more intense uh, and yeah. even more sort of operatic and symphonic. And yeah. so uh, some of this goes back to Battlestar Galactica, truly. Um, oh. In the third season, we needed a version of All Along the Watchtower. Yes. And Ron Moore said to me, I need you to make a version of All Along the Watchtower. And I, we were, he passed me in the hallway and I stopped. I was like, whoa, 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 what? What, what, what should it sound like? And he goes, eh, I don't know, just make it, make it sound like Battlestar. And he turned and he walked away. So I went back to my studio and I drafted a demo that is identical to what you hear on the air. Mm. And what you hear on the air is... Battlestar Galactica meets Indian music meets Rage Against the Machine. Mm -hmm. There's a like hard metal underbelly to that song that I was sure was going to get thrown out. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't. And it fit. And in many ways, like a lot of the roads that lead to singularity, they, they stop by there uh, all, all along the watchtower. And um, it was gritty. Was a song though, like I... Yes. You know, and Battlestar and, and, was gritty. That was, that was, it fit beautifully. It was at a time when like electric guitars were not being used in that way. They were sort of getting oversaturated, but I felt strongly that they needed to be there. And, and I don't even, I, I honestly thought it was going to get thrown out. I thought, look, I got one shot to make something crazy. Let's do mm. it. Um, and it. And it didn't get thrown out. You know, there was a piece that I wrote... I think the whole story is best summarized by... There's a track on the singularity called Escape from the Machines. It's an instrumental track. I wrote Escape from the Machines when I was 15 years old. I didn't wow. change it at all for the singularity. You didn't In change fact, it at all? The first 10 seconds are my cassette recording from 1995. Oh my God, okay. that's so cool. And it's this guitar-based piece that I imagined... And 30 years later, um, it's on my record and Slash is playing the guitar lick that I wrote God, when I was 15. So nuts. that was, he was the guy, I, when I heard November Rain, that made me think rock could be cinematic, right? Mm -hmm. and, and why is it called Escape from the Machines? I was just imagining it like a soundtrack cue for some sort of James Cameron future war. I wasn't trying to write a rock song. Mm -hmm. When I was 15, I was trying to explore film music, film. right? Yeah. And, and then looking back on it, when I was looking back through my sketches and demos and I was building the singularity, I, I heard that and I was like, oh, wait a minute, that was cool. I should do that again. 
It's funny because every one of the bands that you mentioned were showmen. Like their live music was theatrical. It was very, yeah. very theatrical. And and you're right. I remember seeing November Rain when MTV existed. And I remember watching the video for November, November Rain and being like, oh, my God. Number one. Yes. Who is Axl Rose? <laughs> and I mean, like, I, uh, I mean, just in awe, just in awe, yeah. just in awe of the that music, image, everything, of everything. And when I think of Slash, I think of him walking outside that church mm. and the helicopter shot spinning around him playing guitar. Um, don't roses it's, it's, fall to the, don't roses like land on the every, ground and they're like, every, and, but like, and it's like, and the rain is covering the roses and like, oh my God, I can see it all in my head now. Oh God. Yeah. And I that, get it. that's when I thought, oh, oh, I have missed something in popular music. There's something really dramatic there. And, um, you know, I, 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 from there, I like, I discovered, uh, Muse, their early records, um, System of a Down was a huge influence, mm. you know, as we sort of get into the late nineties and ultimately early two thousands. Were you influenced um, by grunge at all? Because growing up in Washington, like I know that my music tastes were so, and still are so rooted in like grunge and ska, which was like huge in the, when we were growing up. I, I, I was very much into that stuff for mm. sure. Um, not as much as I should have been at the time growing up at the epicenter of it. Yeah. Um, but on, on, the, on the singularity as a nod to that, uh, I have, um, a couple of songs featuring Kim Thale from Soundgarden. There and it's go. like the guy who played the guitar on Black Hole Sun is playing on my record. And that tone comes up and you're like, that's, that's Black Hole Sun. Oh my oh, God. So it's kind of like, kind of like Slash for me, where it's like those tones, those, those sounds are so um, instantly memorable. And, and they create a sound that you can hear in two seconds for an instrumentalist to do that is, is incredible. When you hear someone like Slash play, can you tell it's him with your eyes closed? I, I, or can I, people, I think you most can. people can. Yeah, I think many, many people can. Um, I think very few guitarists are in that category uh, where 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 the average person can probably do that. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what the average person knows for sure: the silhouette. Oh yeah, 100%. slash slash. It's like the whole the whole thing, the image and the sound. Um, but he really is that good too. I mean, he yeah. he. There's a reason I was like daydreaming getting to work with him one day when I was 15. Never thought I would actually get to. And and he's on he's on two tracks on the singularity, but the singularity is like literally a dream come true. I mean, Serge Tonkian from System of a Down is on there. Scott Ian from Anthrax. Rufus Wainwright is on there. Scott's so um, great. There are, there are so many um uh, people from Oingo Boingo, one of my favorite bands, are on there. And and it's uh yeah, so in a way it it did two things. I only started writing it because I I wanted to have something that was my own. I I was I realized five years ago, six years ago, that like I must need something more in my life because the more success I was finding in my scoring career was not equating to more happiness. Mm. The analogy I make is if, you're, if you have a bucket and you're pouring water into it, you got a fire hose going into it, but it's got holes in the bottom, it yeah. never fills. And you just keep turning up the faucet, put more in there, and it just never, it never fills. And that's when I realized like, okay, I must be doing something wrong. And I, what, and I, and I had to do some, some soul searching. And then I thought like, what made me really happy? And I remembered for Godzilla, King of the Monsters, I did a cover of a Blue Oyster Cult song called Godzilla. <laughs> and I assembled Serge Tonkian and my favorite metal musicians from a band called Death Clock. I just called them all up and, and they came in. And I was like, I, I, I thought to myself, would they come in if it wasn't mm. really? Like I, I just called them and they came in. What if I wrote something else? Because that made me happy all along the watchtower. That made me happy making yeah. that performance. Honestly, yeah. playing those concerts, those Battlestar concerts with you up in front of that audience, that made me happy. And it wasn't because they were cues from a show. It was because we made a new thing that yeah. people were experiencing live. And it just kind of hit me. That's 
something that's missing from my life. And when I when I created the singularity, which is to say nothing of the graphic novel that I also created with it, yeah, it it just it was like this um, influx of like positivity that just came into my life, and and people started joining it. So was this is the singularity the I just want to understand the scope of it. Is the singularity the score that you created or these songs? Or is it the is it you? Is it the name? Is it like are you gonna create more of the singularity? Or is the singularity like wrapped up in a box and done on vinyl? Go get it. <laughs> well, it is done. Go get it. Yeah, of uh, course. <laughs> yes. Um, but I don't think it is done. I I feel so good about it that I feel it it is the music, but it is also me. It is what I had to say and what I wanted to say, and then the collection of people that came together to help me say it. Um, and then I worked with writers and artists and together we created a graphic novel in response to the music. Yeah. Right. So it's definitely not a soundtrack to that story. The story was born of the music. I wanted to reverse the polarity on my entire creative life. I've been making music for other people's stories mm -hmm. for 25 years. We're going to switch that. Um, and then playing it live was the, the third the third leg of the stool, right? There's the music, there's the comic book, which was published by Image Comics, and then there's the concert experience, which yeah. as of this recording, there's been one, there's going to be more. And we wanted um, to go so bad. We were like, I literally said to my husband, I was like, can we swing it? And we were like right in the beginning of our daughter's treatment. And we were like, dang it, we can't go. But I was about to say, you guys had a lot going on. Yeah, um, well, you know. So, yeah. uh, but there'll be more. There, there, oh, there, there will be more. And, and, and truly it is something that I I hope to continue because I just I love doing it and and I can't wait to do it more so is it going to say stay the same music for your like is it like a this piece is done we will perform this piece and if you create more music does that become is the singularity like part one and like the next one will be called something different or will it always be under the banner of the singularity my instinct is that the the banner of the singularity is useful. Mm. Also, it's inspired because the graphic novel was sort of about multiple universes and this one protagonist that is leaping from universe to universe and and trying to understand um, who he or they are mm. or she, depending on where this person materializes, and that alone and that sort of narrative idea that you can have multiple universes that just spring forth means that i think i can do more and explore other things i want to explore without being without being limited um so right now i you know i i think um sort of a, a sequel to the singularity as opposed to a completely different thing mm -hmm. in the hard rock space is is where i'm leaning um <clears throat> with that said you know i also have completely other things on the burner as well of course um but i i i find that um yeah that the that the like what could fit under the banner of the singularity, it's it's more about the intention and the energy level, right? Uh, like like one of the things I discovered doing it live, we did the record live, and then the um, the uh, encore, we did Godzilla, the so, Blue Oyster Cult. Mm -hmm. I had both Slash and Buck Dharma from Blue Oyster Cult on stage with me. Um, but that little shot of nostalgia for the crowd was so fun. I realized, like, all right, I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself. Uh, I, I am going to open up the set and yeah. pull in more things that can live under that singularity umbrella. Like, at future shows, I I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you started hearing things like ba uh, Battlestar Galactica's All Along the Watchtower might show up. Um, or, you know, songs that I've done for God of War. So yeah. it's like, now that I have established the singularity, maybe the singularity is, is also more about what I want to do on stage with yeah. those people. And things from my scoring career can start to bleed in a little. Now, now that I've created this thing, I don't have to completely firewall it off from the rest of my creative life. 
I just had this like waking fantasy while we were talking about you playing the Hollywood Bowl. Like that would be so fucking epic. Like their summer series, like with just, I don't even know if that's like, I don't even know if that's a cool thing for you, but like, that's just awesome. Like I'd be like, wow. It would be cool. And you know, film composers that have a, Another decade or two beyond me are able to fill the bowl. So my, I'm definitely like long view would love to, would love to be able to do that because oh, here's I think the you thing. could fill the bowl bear. E- e- even if you saw us at the Fonda theater in Los Angeles, which is, it's a big, big club or a small then big venue. Mm-hmm. Um, but the show that I have made, it's like a stadium show. I had a, yeah, a, I know. a giant LED wall with custom animations. And, you know, we did a we did a long set and it's all just super punchy and loud and epic and then and high energy. And so that is definitely uh, the the kind of show I love doing. And, and mm-hmm. it all goes back to what you were saying, right? Queen. Guns and Roses and Pink Floyd that these are these are sort of epic dramatic experiences that you go to see uh, on stage you're not yeah. just going to hear a band play a bunch of songs you're going for an experience and that's where my where my mind is set god it's so cool you know i wanted to be a rock star when i was a kid that was like what i wanted to be i wanted to be a singer that was it and then i I became an actor first. I don't know. How. <laughs> like, I always like I had these dreams of like being on stage and it just it's different now. You know, I'm on stage. It's just I, different. I, I, I get it. And and I and I I also get now really like having spent most of the last 25 years in a room like this being being in the studio i really do understand now the value of being on stage and doing it live and creating this ephemeral thing that warts and all you know might not work but you just keep going and or it'll be amazing but either way the crowd is there they applaud and then it's it's over mm. that that thing is is over and it's so contrary to the recording and i think that was also part of what was starting to like build up in my system almost like plaque right that it's like i'm making these recordings but i'm not getting any kind of immediate feedback uh with an audience and and truly like those battlestar concerts that you were so gracious to be involved in um those were sort of like at the end of that I was getting offers to take that on the road and play in cities. Um, and, and truthfully, um, Katie, I, I had a, a sort of nightmare that I could do that. And then I would be like the Battlestar guy. Yeah. But the show had just ended and I, and I didn't want to do that. I, I get the that. energy it would take to promote those shows, to be like, Battlestar, 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 I'm the Battlestar guy. Yeah. And I kind of, I just, I stepped away. And yeah. I said, no, no I'm going to, I, I got to, I want to do other things in the film scoring space. Um, I have no regrets about that, but that decision did lead to the singularity, right? Yeah. And like 10 years later, I was like, oh my God, I haven't been on stage. I haven't been able to do all those amazing things. And now is the time to go back. But what was missing, like, I, I think I need to make my own material that I want to play live. That's what was missing. Yeah. Um, is Sonatine, is she musical? Sonatine is, is definitely very musical. She's not passionate about it. No, uh, she's now ten. I was gonna say she's eight. She's ten. Wow, God, she's ten. And and uh, and my son, our you're talking is about one and a half. I didn't know if you were talking yeah. about your son. I'm so excited for you, Rhea. We have announced he's there to the world. You have so okay, good. Okay. And what's funny is he. One of his words is guitar. I mean, he is so musical. Like he. I, I I actually think um, Sonatine seems like a a storyteller. Uh, I mean, like if she ended up saying like I want to direct plays or direct film, I'd be like, "Yep, that's what you want to do." Yeah. Um, but he, even at a very young age, it's it's like making sounds, plucking things, hearing things. He loves to come in here to the studio and like really, you know, yeah. It's you're just as a parent, you are 
yearning for that connection. But we also have to recognize, like, this is the time when being independent is what she's learning how to be. You're not going to know everything that happens at school. So that that's what I try to think about, you know, yeah. in terms of that connection. And um, look, that's harder than writing music or playing on stage. You're like harder than, you know getting slashed to play on your record, that is harder. Like, it's that's the part of my life that I'm still struggling with every day, balancing that and how much of my time do I spend being a dad, being a person of my own, being a husband, being an artist, being a professional musician. It, it there, there aren't enough hours in the day, no. you know, to do it all. So it's, no. that's the other thing. When I, when I, you know, to bring it full circle, like I didn't think about that when I was 25. No. At all. And I had really screwed up priorities. Oh God, you know? all I thought about was what I was going to drink on the weekend, not even the weekend, that night, and how many <laughs> packs of cigarettes I was going to smoke that day. I didn't think about much. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. What boy yeah. was cute that I was going to call that night? Like, I really didn't think how much. I probably should have thought more about work, to be honest. <laughs> That's funny. I, uh, for me, it was all work. I, it was yeah. all work. And it really kind of like, I, I I donated my 20s to work mm. and I donated most of my 30s. But in my 30s, I started realizing almost like clockwork, 35, this isn't what was serving me before is not serving me now. Actually, yeah. even earlier, by, by 30, I started to realize like this... this, this drive is, it's like, it's like putting your foot down in first gear. No one knows. Yeah. No one drives out a uh, trans uh, stick shift. Anymore. No one knows how anymore. Or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 overheating the engine, right? Like yeah. I I have to balance this out. So, so. yeah, I get it's that. I, think about a lot. I was very 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 driven from the moment I moved to California, and nothing could get in my way. And I spent a lot of time. I joke about drinking and smoking. I did it by myself. Like I was at home working, you know, and yeah. and, and studying, and like I was, you know, I was so driven and. Like you, I realized that the more success I got, the less joy I actually had in my life. And it was the yeah. opposite of what I thought it was going to be. And I realized that I had to reevaluate how I was living and the people I was surrounding myself with because I wasn't appreciated and I was just working too hard. And, you know. That's a big one. And yeah. it's, it's, it's okay mm. when you realize, you know, this scene, this person, these, these people, like once you kind of realize, like if it's harder to be happy because this is in your life, you know, or, or a job or whatever, like it, it's okay. And, 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 you know, and, and my drive in my twenties, it's why I'm here talking to you. Like, it's why I have a career. Uh, I don't, I have no regrets about investing all yeah. that energy into it, but I I did struggle on how to not do that. I still struggle with that. But it wasn't even until I was 30 that I started thinking even a tiny bit about not just like the people that are around me, but the way I am around people, my my behavior and the things that I'm saying and 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 um my my drive almost became like a toxic positivity. Like I, 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 yeah. I was, I was starting to turn people off professionally, not forgetting about socially. I didn't even have a social life professionally. There would be people that I would find out later, uh, in, you know, my late twenties, early thirties, you know, somebody would call me and say, Oh, you just had a general meeting at a studio. And like, they, I got to tell you, like they called me and they were like, that guy's the biggest asshole I've ever met in my life. Wow. Like, friends, like he's got, he's got such an ego. And I was like, what? Wow. I, and what? I had no idea. But I, I realized, like, for me, I mean, we all have our traits that we don't see. Yeah. For me, my trait, my enthusiasm was so intense, I would just be like a flash flood of ideas for your project and I wouldn't even, like, listen. Listen. Yeah. Wow. But it's so... Thank God you surrounded yourself with people that had the ability and the confidence to call you and say that, because that's a hard conversation Truly. to have with someone. It's a really it hard conversation to have with a friend, or it could be anyway. It shouldn't be, but it could be. No, and it 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 often is, and I am. Yeah. It's not the only time that somebody has mm -hmm. uh, has said something like that to me, and I I always responded with gratitude, and um, and I try to fix it. Yeah. You know. Um, and, 
And yeah, that's just one of those things like uh, you, you just it takes a while to to learn, you know, and 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 I was prepared for Battlestar Galactica musically and sort of professionally, but I, I really wasn't prepared to like in my early 20s, like suddenly I'm on a thing that people are talking about. And yeah. like, there's a billboard up there with, you know, your face on it. And it's like that, that I was, it's very easy to have that go to your head. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you also, we both worked really hard to make that happen. So it's like, you got to balance yeah. those things. It's true. It's true. And the people that you surround yourself with are, are the people that, that, ground you and humble you and fill you with gratitude you know what I mean and that's that is that's what you learn that's what I learned later in life you did just say the magic word by the way gratitude Mm -hmm. that's it yep I mean like if if anyone's listening going oh my god they're rambling and there's all these life lessons what do I what do I take from this it's gratitude that's yeah if you have gratitude and focus on that um, it's it's like an antidote to all the negative things that start to creep up in your mind. You know, like I am not above admitting, uh, you know, like the, the the Emmy nods just came out and there's that voice. It's in, it's still in there in my head. It's like, well, you didn't get nominated. You know, and I'm like, I'm like, what, what are you doing? No, go away. Like, what are you doing there? And then it's like, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the things I get to work on, right? Yeah. Like, but gratitude is the antidote for that. It's like it the, the, you know, the, the, the sunlight that makes the shadows scatter. It's true. Well, th- this interview has literally been sunlight to the day because we haven't talked oh. for a long time. So it's been, it's been really, really special. And I, and I'm glad that you, I'm glad that we talked. I'm glad that, that you're following again, just another beautiful passion that is just a subset of your, your, you know, yourself the singularity sounds so cool where can people find where can people find it where can people find the comic that goes with it like all of that stuff um yeah the comic is available from image comics you can check out their website or any place comic books are sold great um the record is called the singularity it's streaming on all platforms you can go to my website and find uh the vinyl or cd is available on amazon if People I was going to ask if there's vinyl because there's a vinyl and it's a huge collection. It's it. a really cool vinyl. I okay, cool. I'm so excited to have it pressed and in my hands. All right. uh, for those of you that are not into vinyl, check it out on streaming. It's uh, available on all platforms. Um, and it sounds awesome. I'm really happy with it. And oh. there's all these incredible guests on it. Uh, and I want to, I want to print up a sticker that says I listened to the whole thing. Cause it's a big, Is it uh, a big? It, it's big. It's a double album. It's, okay. it's like, I love it. It's like a double album. Um, so cool. and there's some really cool actors on it too. Uh, there's some dramatic monologues. Lee Pace is on there from foundation and deny Guerrera from walking dead and Ryan Hurst from sons of anarchy. So they give you a little bits of the story. Um, it's a, it's a little just bit of my soul that's been put. Uh, that's on super cool. That's uh, super there. Cool. And of course you can, you know, you can find me at all the social media, social stuff. media handles. I, I am everywhere. And then wow. Katie, I wanted to ask you. Yes. At some point, if I'm playing the singularity and we're going to go into all along the watchtower, would you come out and play piano oh on stage with me again? Uh, of course. Always. Yes. Always. It's, all right. Uh, yeah. It's, it's literally is the most terrifying thing. If you ask me to come out on stage and sing, I'd be like, sure. Um, <laughs> you asked me to come play piano. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to wear a diaper. But yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> well, you heard it here first, folks. There it is. Always. For you, Bear, yes, I will. I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Katie. All right. (laughs) Amazing. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Hindsight. Thanks for sticking around with us. As usual, I am joyed. I am joyed. I'm joyed by my producer, Jeff. (laughs) How, How are you, Jeff? I'm joyed by you. I'm good, but I feel like I'm always the one that doesn't want to be here, but I feel like maybe you're struggling to be here right now. I am so tired. Yeah. Um, I'm so tired. 
What's going on? So, um, Ginny finished chemo last week. Well, mm-hmm. no, excuse me. Ginny finished chemo two weeks ago now. So two yeah. weeks ago, she did four rounds. She finished chemo. She This last round was hard. She had to do a blood transfusion. She handled that like a champ. I... There are things that I never even realized, Jeff. I didn't realize that blood transfusions were like um, organ transplants and that the body could actually reject the blood. It never occurred to me. I just thought like, yeah, you plug them in and they just take some blood. Like it never Mm -hmm. occurred to me that like it could go wrong, you know. Um, So that was stressful. She did awesome. Um, And that was over her her levels. The reason she needed to blood transfusion was that her hemoglobin levels went so low mm-hmm. that um that it, it becomes this this sort of like give and take of blood transfusions come with risk. Um, but at the same time, you're you know you're watching your baby who's who's tired and doesn't feel good and is more irritable and, you know, gets tummy aches or headaches or all of these things that are, are sort of, um, indications of a low hemoglobin number. Yeah. Um, but also a lot of that is two and a half year olds, you know what I mean? Like maybe not the headaches and stuff, but a lot of the other stuff. So, you know, we're trying to judge like where she was and, and we've, we've managed to not do any blood transfusions until this last round so we did it and it actually like within a day she just her color came back it was pretty crazy you know and then you start to like weigh that guilt of like god should we have done blood transfusions every time you know like because she's been eligible for them three times but they you know you also don't want to take blood from the blood bank if you really don't need it so you're sort of weighing all these things and you know you just got to let that stuff go but she did really well and and um now we're just doing scans, scans, nice. scans, scans. So, you know, she's been put under like three times, two times this week. And wow. it's just a lot. I'm tired. She's tired, but she's a fucking champion. So. Yeah, I bet. And now you get to spend time with me. <laughs> and now I get to spend, well, you know what though? Like that's like, it's always, it's good to have distraction when you're going yeah. through crap like that, you know? And, yeah. but I think that like now we're at the tail end of it. And her scans are all coming back clear, which is like. That's great. Amazing. Yeah, Um, that's great. Yeah, but I feel like sort of at the end of the job, do you get that way that sometimes at the end of a job, and I'm notorious for this, where I get sick at the end of a job. Right. Where like you hold it together, you hold it together, you hold it together, and then your body goes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it also doesn't help when you are getting older. As well, not you. I mean me. You're you're ageless, of course. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're the one that said to me at one point when I told you how old I was. I said I was forty, and your response was, "Are you only 40? <laughs> <laughs> you know those moments when you when yeah. like you you like it's like a baby foot in the mouth. Yeah. But like yeah. it's like you didn't mean it that way like i just always assumed that you and yeah. i were like the same age we're not that and granted, far we, off. we're not but like you know yeah i always thought that like we were like legitimately the same age like right. we're both staring down 45 that's not true like you're yeah, i mean we wouldn't I'm, have been in high school together jeff um yeah we would have we would have but you would have been a senior when i was a freshman i think what year did you graduate 98 yeah i started in 98 so i would have oh, okay. been a freshman and you would have been a senior okay yeah. All right. So okay. we're not that right. far off. We're not that far off. But I think that was sort of my reaction. But you always have those moments where you go, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. Well, I wanted it to. my point was you're doing a lot. And I think, I think give yourself some grace. You're, you're, you're oh. getting through it. You're, you're allowed to have four cups of coffee and be a little tired. I'll pretend yeah. like I want to be here just to make up for it <laughs> for now. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's 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 a lot. It's a lot. But yeah. you know what? Everything's great. And then the crazy thing is that my in-laws have been here. Do you have you ever been married? No. Okay. Um do your parents ever come for extended times to stay with you? Uh no. 
Okay. <laughs> but my my partner's parents have come for a little, not extended, but like yeah. for a weekend or a okay. couple of days. Maybe, I guess they've stayed for like a week before, but they're Do fantastic. Do they stay with you guys? Week. Yeah, they've stayed with us before. Yeah. yeah. Well, now that we've got a space where they can stay, previously they wouldn't, but. Right, because it's like, they're yeah. like up your shit. Right. Yeah. Um, my in-laws moved in for the last almost four months oh, to wow. help us with the new baby and Ginny going yeah. through her um, chemo and stuff. And um, they left today. Oh, wow. Like wheels up left. And I was doing an interview this morning, sitting right where I'm at, and I can see the driveway. And as they were leaving, I like shed a tiny invisible tear. Yeah. That my, f- any freedom that I kind of pretended I had as a as a mother of two children. Yeah. Was driving away. <laughs> <laughs> I was like There oh they God. go. <laughs> I, sh- I sure don't sure don't want to stay for another three months. Until they're eighteen. Yeah. Are you positive you don't yeah. want to stay? It's um I love my in laws and you know, watching them drive away really sort of I was like, Oh man. <laughs> but I'm well, going to be even more tired now. I think so. Yeah. It's all of that just like yeah. came down on me today. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, getting away, are you going to be anywhere coming up that you know about, you want to talk about before we get into this episode? We should actually talk about that because I um, have a lot coming up. October 18th, 19th, 20th, I am at a convention in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. So come out and see me that weekend. The 25th of October, I am at the Battlestar Galactica reunion convention in Chicago. I am only there Friday, you guys. So I think I'm the only Battlestar Galactica cast member that is only there Friday. Chicago, October 25th. All the money I'm making at my table is going to pediatric cancer. Awesome. I love Chicago. Come. I'm only signing Battlestar Galactica. I'm not signing anything else, but all the money is going to charity. Um, then I'm flying from Chicago to Texas and appearing in San Antonio on the 26th and 27th. Um, so come see me in San Antonio. Then I'm flying to Rhode Island on to, for the 2nd and 3rd to go to Rhode Island Comic Con. And then on the 8th, 9th, and 10th, I am going to be in Nashville. And then... I'm getting more (laughs) tired now that you're just explaining this. (laughs) On the 29th, 30th, and 1st of November, October to November. You mean November to December? Oh, no, that's November to December, December, guys. I'm going to be in Germany. Germany, right, right. We talked about the Germany we trip. We did talked about. We talked about the German. We trip. did talk about the Germany trip, and I'm going to try to join you in Nashville if I can. I, because it's your birthday. It's my birthday, and that's where my family lives. Are you 45? <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Turning um, 41. 41, the most useless age. Yeah. Well, speaking of bears, great. Uh, there were the question I had about this, and I did not know this, but. Mm. You mentioned a couple of times that you'd played with him on some yeah. concerts. And also you mentioned that you maybe are not good at playing. <laughs> so I'm intrigued to know, well, first off, on the show, how did that work? Like, were you actually playing on the show? Yes. So I, like I said, I grew up with playing piano, with a rudimentary understanding of piano. I played as a kid, like, you know, I hated it. It's one of those things, like, I wish I'd stuck with it. Because, like, I sing, and I would love to be able to sit at a a keyboard or a piano and actually, like, write music. I would love that. Yeah. Um, um, But, so for the show, my character has a flashback scene with, do you remember the scene where I played I with... Yep my dad. That is me playing. I just had to memorize it. Yeah. Um, it's not that difficult. You know, it's pretty, it literally is a step above chopsticks. Yeah. Um, and then Bear called me and said, <laughs> would you come do this live with me? And I was like, 
<laughs> okay. I don't, number one, I don't like being, I can't sing in public. Yeah. And I know I sing well, and I don't like to sing in public. I know I don't play piano well, and you want me to do this in front of people? Like, I don't, like, this is not, Yeah. oh my God. Um, And my ex at the time, Scott, God love him, um, still very close with him. Um, He was like convinced me. He goes, look, like, even if it goes terribly, do you want to, do you want to miss out on this experience? Like the experience is worth the sort of like insecurity and the fear, you know, yeah. like I feel like you just go for it. And so I was like, okay. And I did it and I was terrified. I found a video. Um, yeah, it's not good playing, like, you know, but, and <laughs> I, I think in reality, um, if it had gone worse and I did make some mistakes, it would have been even better. Are you going to play I, it? Yeah, I haven't watched it yet, but do you remember this? I do. I was so nervous. <laughs> did you only do it the one time? I did, just the one time. <laughs> Where was this at? Someplace in LA. Um, it's an outdoor theater where the the seats rise up like a bowl. The Hollywood Bowl? <laughs> it wasn't the Hollywood Bowl. It wasn't that big. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he said that we were playing this and he's like so I want it to be like it was on the show I want for you to act as if you're learning it again yeah so (laughs) so we sort of like you know played around with not knowing it yeah 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 (laughs) So cool. <laughs> yeah, looks like you're into it. So the the one of the things I love so much about Bear um and and the music that he creates is the um the the percussion. Yeah. The bass to the the that he uses in so many of his projects. It just it really does like it sort yeah. of makes your body start to move. Um and he he's just god he is so talented yeah so talented yeah it sounds like uh it was really fun hearing him talk about getting to play with slash and all that stuff and then yeah just listening to the little bit of uh, his album the singularity you can definitely see where that influence comes from in yeah, play it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like listening to guar yeah you know what i mean like i don't really <laughs> i don't really know that kind of like death metal yeah like I don't quite understand that yeah. that music in the sense that um I I've, I've not listened to it. It's always felt like um really violent to me. Um, yeah. but what's interesting is if I if I go and I listen to the singularity because I know how talented Bear is and I know how his brain works, I've actually started to see the the music in it as opposed yeah. to just, you know, what oh, I thought it was, which is a lot of metal- screaming. Metal music is highly complicated. Like it's mm. very close to um, classical music. Like you can go on YouTube and watch a lot of people taking like classical guitar and playing metal songs on it, and it almost sounds like you're listening to like chamber music from the 1700s because it's that really? kind of in- intricacy, but done fast and hard on electric guitars. You know? Yeah. So, Do you play music? I don't know. I, yeah. My brother and sister are musicians and they're very talented and that just skipped me completely. <laughs> what do your brother and sister do in music? My brother is a songwriter and a singer, musician, guitar player, piano player. My sister is an incredible singer. Um, wow. They've got a band called... Both in called, Nashville? Yeah, they're in Nashville. They got a band called Pageant in Nashville and wow. then they they just started a new band called Lost Daughter because they've been doing Pageant for like 10 years and they changed up stuff so when we're in nashville maybe you'll have to come check them out that's uh, cool that's cool yeah i um i (laughs) i briefly dated um christian bush from Mm sugarland okay and christian and his brother are remind me a lot of bear in their their 
the, their musical understanding and um, the way that they create music and how many instruments they play and how um, I've never been around musicians that much. Like, you know, my dad played piano by ear. Yeah. Um, um, never knew how to read music, um, but he just played by ear and he played beautifully. So I grew up around like that, but I never grew up around somebody who had um, a classical trained yeah. musical background. You know what I mean? Like somebody yeah. who had like that depth of understanding of music and um, bear is, is just, I've never seen anything like that. I can't imagine growing up in a household like that. Like, were you yeah. intimidated by your brother and sister? No. I mean, I'm yeah. the oldest, so hmm. I was off doing my own thing. I wasn't, you know, just, just proud. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. So. That's so sweet. I love that they have a band too. Yeah, they're great. I actually wanted to touch on one thing about Bear. I am amazed at how he got that job. Is that not crazy? Yeah, I mean, just sort of like right place, right time type of situation. Right yeah. place, right time, and the boss who was like, eh, yeah. I'm too busy. Yeah. And so they're, you know, what was because... The... The note, I think, on All Along the Watchtower was funny to me, too, where he told Bear that he wanted to do that song. And he said, how do you want it to sound? And he just said, I just kind of like Battlestar, you know? Yeah. And then he nailed it. <laughs> you know, and I think that we've talked about this a little bit before. There was a lot of um, uh, sort of things, big story points that fell on Starbuck as we went along, like all along the watchtower and things like that, that were her character. And, and at one point, I don't even know if they cut it out. They might have cut it out. No, I think it's left in there. Did, did, did I have to say somewhere all along the watchtower? I don't remember. So that was a line that I was given when Eddie said, Starbuck, where did you take us? Mm -hmm. And at one point, it, my line back to him was somewhere all along the watchtower. And I think it was cut out. Maybe it wasn't. I don't remember. Because there are times as an actor where I think to myself, I'm confident. I know I'm, you know, proficient at my job. Yeah. I can't say that. <laughs> it's just a little, uh, a little maybe too on the nose, perhaps. I don't know how to say that and not sound like a bad actor. Yeah. Let's see if but this I is... might have said it. Qu'est-ce que tu entends? This is not in English. Alors prends ton flingue et fais rentrer le chat. Bien, aussi Amiral. Well. YouTube. Did you know that the same people in every country that voice me have been voicing me for like 25 years? I know that that's a thing, but that's cool. Have you ever met them? No. I know that the um, the German woman and I think the French woman have um, for many, 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 many years, but in every country, yeah, um, there's someone who, because in a foreign country, if someone's listening to a, a performance of mine in the foreign language and not in English dubbed, they don't think I sound the way I sound. They actually hear me as the 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 local actor right. who's doing it. So I could sound completely different to some people. It's so weird. Yeah. It's so cool. It's such a weird you, part of yeah. this business. You sound like this. Starbuck. <laughs> Qu'est-ce que tu entends? That's Eddie. There you are. Alors prends ton flingue et fais rentrer le chat. That's Eddie. Bien aussi, Amira. That's you. Anyway. That was me saying somewhere all along the watchtower, sir. I, if um, if uh, if that actor does a movie that is then brought over to America and needs to be dubbed into English, would you do then their voice? I mean, that'd be cool. Yeah, it should be that way. It should be that way, right? It only makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so you guys were talking about active contrition, and there was just a little bit where you guys weren't sure what happened in that episode, so I just pulled oh, yeah. the description there oh. <laughs> so you could, so we could get that straight of what happened. So 33 is the first episode of the first season in the pilot? Yeah, so 33 he talked about yes. was his first episode, and that's the first episode that comes back. So after the miniseries, when you guys got, a, you know, yes. got the full series order, 
the first episode back is is called 33. Right. And that's the first one that Bear did the full score for. And that's the episode we talked about with Eddie almost mm-hmm. in his episode where everyone was like staying awake for mo- many, many days ahead of time. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to do that. It <laughs> was as a, as a method acting exercise. Yeah. 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 As and a method you, thing. Yeah. You did. Um, Not the, me. The Not Anthony Hopkins way. Have you heard the Anthony Hopkins quote where he, somebody was talking, he was talking to some method actor and Anthony Hopkins just says, you could try acting. Yeah. <laughs> I think Lawrence Olivier also said the same thing. It's, it's called acting, my dear boy, or something like that. Yeah. Maybe I have it wrong who it is. I don't but, know. I, I'm sure there's yeah. many people that have yeah, said it yeah. before. Okay. So at Fire J Hawk says, about the rude comments, have you looked into shadow banning people? If you haven't, shadow banning someone makes it so that they still comment, but for everyone else, their comment is hidden. So they're basically screaming into the void and don't realize no one can see their comments. This is better than banning people because if they get banned, they get a notice saying they were banned and they'll just make a new account and keep being assholes. But shadow banning doesn't notify them that they're shadow banned. So I didn't realize that that's what shadow banning was, but I already do that. I mean, I know this is a thing on Twitter, but I didn't know you could do it on Instagram or even YouTube, but... So you hide the user. Well, no. So we actually block people on YouTube. I didn't know that you can do it on Instagram. I do this. On Instagram, if somebody makes a comment or something that's like a little like distasteful or like borderline, I will restrict them. And what that means is that I can see what they're writing. It says restricted. So if I don't want to see it, I don't have to, but nobody else can. Right. And so what I'll do is I basically put that person in like purgatory. And if they continue to say rude things, I then block them. But if it was like a one-off and like, you know, um, then I... I unrestrict them. You put them in timeout for a little while. and I do. Yeah. But they don't know they're in timeout. <laughs> Such a mom. Such a mom, though. <laughs> but it's true. Like, you know, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I agree with you, though. Oh, and he also said, love the podcast. Thank you. Um. So, uh, Kevin... Ola's 70 or 2789 said vacuum seals and cedar chest have helped my wife with moths. No, no, no. Yeah. He said, um, read that again. <laughs> vacuum seals and cedar chest have helped my wives with moths. Wives. <laughs> <laughs> that one really made me laugh. <laughs> no judgment. No judgment. Um, uh, yeah, it hasn't worked for me. No. But we just found out, Jeff, it may not be moths. Uh-oh. Well, I think it's some moths, but we found out we have carpet beetles. It's a thing in Oregon. I've never fucking heard of it before. So um, we had a rash. I had a, like a uh-huh. what looked like bites on my legs. And I was like, oh, my God, if I brought home bed bugs, I yeah. am going to freak out like oh my god yeah and then i kind of let it go because i was like maybe it's like fleas maybe like the dogs brought some fleas in Mm -hmm. so i let it go and then robin got it and then Ginny got it and i was like oh no so we stripped our bed like stripped the bed looked like fine tooth comb found two little things in our bed and i was like no but then we kept looking because i was like two little tiny things that are dead don't leave these bites like right. that's not there and and there were very clearly no bed bugs on the bed yeah so i was like what is happening so i started looking i was like maybe they're in the dog's bed so i start looking at the dog's bed and i was like oh, there's more so then we start grabbing them and putting them in a plastic bag so i was like okay let's yeah. you know and then all of a sudden robin's knuckle starts to itch and he was like i was like that's where they bit you right now that's crazy so then we put everything in bags, we find them all along the carpet. And I was like, these do not look like bed bugs. They yeah. don't look like bed bugs. Um, and so then we called the exterminator guy. He was coming out, but Robin immediately like started to do some research and they looked exactly like carpet beetles. Carpet beetles are in the Northwest. A mm-hmm. large majority of houses have them. Supposedly it's very common. Um, they eat organic material. They will eat dog fur. 
Okay. And wool carpets and all that stuff. So very similar to like the moths, which could be why the carpets have been getting eaten. But they don't bite. But people are allergic to them. So you can get a rash from them. Uh, and uh, we always take our decorative pillows that Robin hates that I have and we throw them in the corner and then we put them back on the bed every morning. Uh, That's how they got in the bed. Anyway, so the guy came and we've got, you know, an infestation of carpet beetles, but they're gone. No. Great. They're gone. Yeah. And there's no carpet, there's no carpet beetle balls to to get rid of them. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> No, I wish. Um, all right. Uh, we need to get into the mail sack. Let's go into the mail sack. Let's do it. Mail sack. We're going to the mail sack. Mail sack. Why are we calling it mail sack? I love you. Okay, so Hendrik from Germany says, okay, so there is a thing that kills moth. Uh, in Germany, we can order them on Amazon, parasitic wasps. They're tiny, good killers, and just die and become dust, much more pleasant than the moth. Do you want to try to say parasitic wasp in German? Yes. She included the the word it, for she, parasitic wasp. She did, okay. Schulpstedt, but didn't... They're tiny, good killers, and they just die and become dust. Much more pleasant than moth. Schulpfwespen. 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 There you go. Schulpfwespen. Schulpfwespen. So you can order Schulpfwespen on Amazon in Germany to get rid of moths. To get rid of them. Um, A little weird. To, like, bring something called wasp into your house. (laughs) Parasitic wasp. Parasitic wasp. You know what this reminds me of? There's that island. Do you remember the island that had a problem? It's like you hear about these islands where they're, like, they've Mm -hmm. got, they're overrun with rodents, so they bring in cats. And now the cats are fucking taking over the island. Now it's called Cat Island. Happy, go away. I'm talking here. And... Or, like, there's this one, it's called, like, uh, Spider Island or something, that there was something that was taking over the island, whether it be, or maybe it was the spiders, and then they brought something in to get rid of the spiders. Have you seen pictures of this, Jeff? It's, like, this island where it's covered in spiders, like, Um, nests and webs everywhere. I don't, I have not seen this, no. Is it Googleable? Oh, spiders take over Antelope Island, is that? Yes. Guam, Antelope Island, and Spider Island in Wisconsin. So there's two different ones. I think I'm thinking of the Spider Island in Wisconsin. But they, I think they released the spiders. Or they've released something to try and kill the spiders. But it all seems bad Hmm. to me. (laughs) So so what you're saying is you don't want to bring parasitic wasp into your house to get rid of your carpet beetles? No. Or I would rather i mean listen if we had bed bugs though and they were like there's this rat that eats bed bugs yeah i might you might let a rat run around your house to eat bed bugs. i might yeah i might especially if it turned into dust yeah have you ever <laughs> the rat turns in <laughs> after it eats a certain amount it just poof. i mean yeah. yeah have you had bed bugs no have you no, I haven't, but yeah. Ro- one of Robin's very, very close friends had an infestation of bed bugs. Ooh. And for y- it, it was bad. It was really bad. It actually, we believe, contributed to his downfall of his relationship. Oh, yeah, um, because mean. if you think about it, you have bed bugs. There's, you already feel horrible. Yeah. It was in this old building. So they couldn't, they, it, they treated it multiple times, couldn't get it out. But now you got to deal with the fact that you have a partner who you yeah. don't live with, who's now scared to come to your house. Yeah. And they're scared for you to come to their house. And yeah. like, you know what I mean? Or you're scared to leave your house and potentially take them to one of your friend's houses. Like it's, and there's legitimately nothing you could do about it. They finally had to rip like this old trundle bed out of the wall that was like attached to the, I mean, it was a lot. Um, and it really, it traumatized the shit out of him. I'm sure. Yeah. It's there. I've known people that have had them and it's the same thing. Yeah. Cause you, it's just, 
trying to get rid of them. It's like, it's like psychological warfare on your brain. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It sort of makes me feel like anytime I, cause I travel a lot for work, right? Like mm-hmm. a lot for work. I've actually started thinking about that when I come home from work, not putting my suitcases back in the house, leaving them in the garage, really easy to do, and doing the laundry from the garage, yeah. you know? Um, I've thought about that because you can't, it's, they're everywhere. They're, it doesn't matter what kind of hotel you stay in. Like, what kind of places are they putting you up at? <laughs> Look, I've had a friend who got bed bugs from a Ritz-Carlton. Mm. Well, they were high, cla- high class bed bugs. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to have yeah. bed bugs, have the right. rich bed bugs, right? <laughs> um, so Heinrich, I don't know if we're, we're probably messing up yeah. that name brutally, but uh, she also sent in a recording of our male sack song, but completely sing in German. Do you want to hear it? Stop. This should be the last thing we do. Yeah. Here we go. go. Brief sack. Begin jetzt zum Briefsack, Briefsack. Warum nennen wir es Briefsack, Briefsack? Oh, I loved it. Oh, shit. Did you hear that little thing at yeah, the end? Yeah, it was. It was. Very good. Very good. I love that it comes across like Briefsack. Yeah. Briefsack is what I'm hearing. <laughs> Which also sort of makes sense. A Briefsack. <laughs> Briefsack. It's a new briefcase. Yeah. Um, number one. Beautiful voice. Thank you for yeah. that. Wonderful. Yeah. I really appreciate that. It was lovely. And I also like how her voice cracked at the end. Yeah. Like she went for it. Lisa. <laughs> See? It's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I like that. That was nice. Yeah. Um, you guys, thank you for listening to this hindsight. This was a long one. Yeah, we might cut some of this. <laughs> Jeff always cuts out everything about himself. So, oh no, I'm gonna, I might, I might do Robin a favor on this one. <laughs> oh no, leaving Robin's penis stuff. Now, if we have, love it. if we have cut it, I'm just leaving that line that you just said, so people will wonder what we're talking <laughs> what <the> about. <laughs> oh, if it's God. still in there, I'm sorry, but if it, if it is not in there. You're left in mystery to wonder you what it was. You know what? We can save it for another hindsight. That's true. When, when we can finally get Robin back on here to speak for yeah. himself. Um, you guys, um, thank you for watching The Hindsight. We appreciate you as always. Remember to come back next week when our guest is somebody else who's awesome. I don't know who it's going to be. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and um, until then... Um, We will see you next Tuesday. And that's what's up.